Hey everybody, I have a new shirt, so that's good, I guess. Um, today's episode is all about the Bolex EBM, which is the electronic bayonet mount magazine EBM version of the Rex 5. This is my EBM. And the EBM was the first all-in-one motor drive camera that uh, Payard made. And it is a really, really great camera because you can get them for not a crazy amount of money. They have an integrated battery and handle system, which is relatively nice. It's pretty easy to hold. You just kind of go like that, you know, and you got your, you got your shot. Um, they have a bayonet mount on the front of them, which means that very, very simply, you can convert to pretty much any other short flange distant mounts that you want. So like uh, C mount uh, is what I have here, but you could also put on it a, um, you know, Airy B glass, or you could put on it PL or Nikon, and adapters are available for many different types of lenses. The camera is, considered one of the better cameras in terms of its viewfinder. It has the kind of a later generation viewfinder. It goes to 50 frames a second versus 64, which is unusual. Doesn't have the ability to do stop motion, which is also unusual for a Bolex. It can rewind the film, but it has no counter to let you know what frame you're on. Kind of unusual for a Bolex. And, um, you know, at the time when they made this, it was the idea that people would use this for news photography, but it still makes too much noise to be used for news photography unless you're a mile away or have a heck of a blimp on it. So we're gonna break down the camera and the features today a little bit. We're gonna show you how to load it and great details of where things are located. And we're gonna talk about its successor, the uh, EL. And we're also gonna talk about the windup version of this called the SBM. There were lots of motor drive 16 cameras hitting the market all at the same time in the early 70s. and you know, I would say that when I look at this camera, to me, it is more like a rush design where, you know, Payard was saying, hey, we need to make a camera that competes with what we see in the market. And because right after this came out, only a couple years later, they came out with the EL, which is a more complete Bolex with the normal Rex 5 H16 features, but with an integrated motor drive. Um, the SBM which is the bayonet mount version that's spring-loaded, S for spring-load, is basically just a regular Rex 5, but with a bayonet mount in it, right? So it's this pretty much the same camera. The idea was is that um, if you wanted a bayonet mount, but hand crank, you could do that. And then you could also add a motor to that if you wanted to and, and run it with a motor drive. But as we all know, the wind-up Bolexes make a lot of noise. This one's a little bit quieter than the wind-up cameras. The EL is a substantially better camera. You can get ELs with an integrated light meter. You can get ELs that run the 64 frames a second and to have crystal sync generator that works. You can get um, the EL battery system goes in the side of the camera. So it's kind of more integrated. It's very, very nice. You don't have this handle situation. The EL does single frame mode. Um, you know, it's a, it's a different camera and it's a better camera. It's quieter. And so a lot of people think the EL is kind of the best, the best, the best. And, and I agree with that. I think the EL is the best Bolex made by far. So I got this camera at a sale for relatively cheap money many years ago. And it was a camera that I had never really wanted. I kind of wanted a wind-up camera because I remember using those when I was in college and I wanted to do still frame stuff. But I got this camera at the same time I had my Aton and I was just shooting everything on the Aton. And so I said, well, I kind of want a Bolex as a secondary camera, as a backup camera, right? Why not? So I bought the camera and I very rarely used it. And then over time, there were situations where I kind of needed to have a handheld camera that was a little bit smaller than my XTR. Because once you add a lens to the XTR and all the accoutrement, it's a big camera. And when you run 100 foot daylight spools in it, it it's kind of doesn't work as well. So when I do little things where I just want to run 100 foot daylight spools for whatever reason, I bring this camera out. And so I have used this camera quite a bit on personal projects. And it's actually been a lot of fun to use. And where I do think the viewfinder isn't very good compared to obviously the Spirit of Reflex cameras, it's workable, right? It's passable. It's not horrible. 
Um, where I do think that the size of the camera, when you put the battery on it and everything, is kind of tall, right? Um, the handle grip is nice. And it allows you to kind of hold it upright and kind of get your shot and keep the camera against your, your face. And then you can, you know, change focus with the other hand. So that's kind of nice, actually, in reality. Like a lot of the other uh, Rex 5 cameras, you can run a 400-foot magazine. For me, it doesn't make any sense. I've got a 400-foot magazine camera. Why would I care about running a 400-foot magazine on my Bolex? doesn't make any sense to me. The Bolex also has a really neat feature, which is that the reflex system is kind of this whole assembly right here. It sticks off the front of the camera. And so converting this to Super 16 is actually super stupid easy. And when they design this camera, there's a couple things that you look at and you go, wait a second, that looks like they were kind of designing it for Super 16. For instance, the area where the ground glass is has more room for a larger, wider ground glass to you know, cover up the Super 16 area. The shutter is wider than it needs to be to cover up for Super 16. You know, so they were thinking about Super 16 when they built this camera. Someone was very smart. And so converting these to Super 16 is super easy. It's a, um, there are screws that are offset that move this entire assembly off to the side. just a tiny bit, right? We're only talking a couple millimeters. And in doing so, it moves the lens mount in the right position, right? And then um, they change the ground glass to a Super 16 ground glass and then the gate. And that's pretty much it. The rollers are all Super 16, the sprockets are Super 16. So you're kind of ready to go with this camera for Super 16 for not much money. In fact, I've been researching recently uh, to convert some other people's cameras and I've noticed that the pricing has gone down considerably on Super 16 mods. I've seen guys advertise as low as $550 to mod these cameras to Super 16. Now, I'm not saying anybody can get that deal, but that's an amazing deal. That's a worthwhile deal, you know? And they supply new gates so that you have a very small Super 16 rail. And it's it's really not a bad idea. So if you really want to get into Super 16 shooting and you want a bayonet mount to run PL glass with, this camera is actually probably the better deal. ELs go for a lot of money. And don't get me wrong, they're worth the extra money. There's no doubt about it. But if you're going to spend $2,000 on an EBM, which is an average price right now, versus four to five thousand dollars in EL, the differences are so minor that it might not be worth it, unless you can find an EL with a PL adapter and you want to use PL glass. And so, of course, the downside of Super 16 is that all your old school glass that is one of the cool things about using these cameras where you could use these C-mount glass, none of that's going to work anymore, right? So all of a sudden you kind of lose the ability to run all those cool C-mount lenses unless you use longer lenses. And I have a video coming out all about Super 16 and the image circle and why it's, you know, when you use longer lenses, it's not that big of a deal, but the wider lenses are a big problem between standard 16 and Super 16. You really have to buy Super 16 glass. But for me, I have a ton of Super 16 glass. So putting, you know, my Zeiss, you know, 12 to 120 on here with a PL mount makes sense. And you look at this camera and you wonder why I'm still using this glass. And the reason why is really simple. I want to buy an EL and I want to convert that to Super 16. And I've been kind of waiting for the right deal to come up because I would love to have uh, EBM. It's a little bit quieter, you know, and the EL is a little bit quieter. And I would love to have an EL just to have an EL because it is like the best Bolex, right? And hopefully in the near future, I can buy one and do a video about it because it is on my short, short, short list and then convert to Super 16 and have a really nice backup camera. One of the other problems with a Bolex is kind of the viewfinder system. It's a real problem. And I'm unaware of anybody who came up with an adjustable viewfinder for these because you theoretically could. You know, you've got this rail system in the front here. You could come up here and off to the side with a reflex viewfinder relatively easy. So I'm kind of shocked that no one did that because if you could do that, then you come off to the side, reflex viewfinder is adjustable over here, and then you could put your video tap right here with a beam splitter in it. It's pretty doable. So the viewfinder is not very good, okay? Even on the EL, it's not very good. The fact that it's a beam splitter is great because you don't have to deal with the, the, the reduction in luminance when you shoot with a spinning mirror reflex camera, okay? So that's a real benefit. The downside is, of course, you're shooting through a piece of glass. Now, 
that's a huge problem because dirt could get in that glass for one, but two, and more importantly, you're losing a little bit of light. You lose about three quarters of a stop by running this beam splitter system. So, you know, when you're looking at a lens that goes to F, you know, 1.8 here, you're kind of 2.2, you know, 2.4 range um, as, your, as your best. And so that kind of sucks, okay? And I'll be honest with you. But if that's the only downside, it's not the end of the world. Being able to stop the lens down and still have a bright enough viewfinder is also really nice to have. So there's pros and cons. But the fact that viewfinder's in the back and it's not adjustable, kind of kind of sucks. It reminds me a lot of Super 8 cameras where the viewfinder is never adjustable on those cameras. It reminds me a lot of the earlier Aries, like the uh, Aerie S and M um, and the, um, you know, the, the early 35 cameras where it was just not adjustable. Heck, even the Aerie 3 was the first camera of its type that had a orientable viewfinder. It could go up and down. It couldn't do anything else, but it could just go up and down. It's a lot of work to do that though. The internals to, to make that adjustment happen is a lot of internal work. So having a fixed viewfinder is super easy to do and low cost. And that's why a lot of cameras had that. And so I get it, I totally get it, right? I understand why they did it, but at the same time, it would be nice to have an orientable viewfinder for Bolex because it would raise the value up a lot. Because if you could stick the camera on your side here, right, and look through a viewfinder right there like that, and then you could have a little shoulder kit for it, this camera would be much more widely used, I believe because the movement is super good. It's a very, very good movement. It has excellent registration. It'll go forwards and backwards, pretty amazing. And again, it's pretty quiet. And the motor drive is really the only problem. The physical motor itself makes a whine noise. And even when you lubricate it and clean it up, it still makes that noise. And so you're always hearing that. Um, we recently did a video where we were trying to see how stable this camera was in terms of, um, if it would fall out of sync or not with a digital audio recording. And we did a pretty long take and it didn't fall out of sync at all. Take a look. This clip should stay pretty close to being in sync, but we have a sync generator coming to us really soon and we're gonna be doing a test all about that later. But I think this camera is pretty close to being in sync. And if it's not, it just means it's not running at the same speed throughout the entire piece. So we'll be good. Now back to you at the studio. All right, so that's pretty amazing that without a sync generator at 24 frames a second, it actually runs really good at sync sound speed. So that's a real value for this camera for somebody who might want to shoot sync sound. However, and this is the big problem, it still makes too much noise. In that clip, you could kind of barely hear the camera ticking in the background, but I was relatively far away from the camera and I had a cover over the camera, I had a ferny pad, because I wanted to see if we had a ferny pad, it would reduce the sound a little bit, and it works. I mean, with the furniture pad, it really dampened the sound enough so it would work. And that's kind of one of the things about it that kind of sucks, is that it could be a little bit quieter. And again, the EL is a little bit quieter. So no, it's not gonna ever be a sync sound camera. You know, it's never gonna be that camera that you use instead of a, you know, modern spinning reflex camera like an SR or, you know, an, an Aton, XTR, or LTR, or whatever. It's not gonna replace that camera, but it is a great companion camera. And what I mean by that is it's a great camera to get your B-roll shots with. It's a great camera to go on vacation with. I got a little backpack, it fits in perfectly. It's a great camera um, to use for any MOS stuff like music videos and stuff like that because it's not so loud where you can't hear music in the background, of course. And it's a super lightweight, good camera. And it's hard to find those because there are a lot of other models. There's the Canon Scopic and there's the Brilliu, you know, R16. And then there's the, um, you know, the Airy S and Airy M. And there's a lot of these kind of small, lightweight cameras, but all those cameras have a lot of other problems to them. It's not that easy to make a camera that is all in one, that is that is compact, has integrated batteries and all that stuff. It's, no one really did that, you know, where you could change the lenses and everything. It was weird. You know, every camera has its problems. The S&M are kind of heavy and have external batteries and, and, and getting a crystal motor is tough and, you know, they make a lot of noise and, 
the the Bill U, you know, R16, it's a really great camera, but they're they, they have problems with reliability electronic wise especially and um, they only have a, a C mount available for them. You know, you can't do a bayonet mount so you can convert the PL. Uh, of course you can get a PL to C adapter, but whatever. Um, you know, and they, they, I think they do make a crystal version of it. They do make a quartz crystal version of the, um, that camera. I forgot the model, but they do make one. But it's, again, relatively loud camera. And the Scopic has, a, you know, lenses can't come off and aren't interchangeable. And so this camera does kind of stick out from the other ones that are available in the market. It is kind of a specialty thing. And that's why it is such a cool camera. It's relatively easy to load with the automatic loading system. Um, again, stable image and Super 16 compatibility is no big deal. Uh, guaranteed, right? You don't have to get a certain generation. Like this is a 37 Bolex, one of the first ones made by Payard. And it is a double perf camera. But this is ready to go. And if you want to shoot a 400 foot magazine, you can get magazines no problem at all for 500 bucks, you know, on eBay. It's, it's not a problem. They plug into this connector right here and the magazine just kind of sits here and you're good to go. One of the other issues that I want to mention before I move on to going into detail on the camera is that that is the tripod mount. And um, yeah, it's a problem because this handle's in the way. So I believe you can take this handle off or move it around, um, but the handle's in the way. So I have this kind of really small tripod I use with this camera that has a very, very small plate and it just barely fits in here properly and it works okay. But you know, my standard commercial tripods won't work with it at all. You have, so that's kind of sucks, right? To, to have this special thing. You could put it on the bottom of the camera, right? The tripod attached to the camera and then um, they make a little tiny battery adapter that allows you to stick the battery on the side of the camera here, but it's kind of clunky and I don't know. It's, it's not great. I hate cables running around the camera, you know? The EL has a cable that runs kind of on the back of the camera to the side to plug the battery in. It's okay, right? But once you have a longer cable than that and it's kind of be, it's gonna be loose and stuff, ah, oh, gosh. And of course, the fact that you can't really run a video tap and look through the viewfinder at the same time is a kind of a killer for commercial work. So yes, you can put a tap on the back of this. Dual cameras got them. They're great, and you can. I think. I think you could even get them to do an HD one. I, I don't know, Jeff. You'll have to tell everybody, but um, I, I think this is an HD version you can get for a tap. And uh, but again, you can't look at the viewfinder at the same time, so that's kind of a hindrance, right? So it, you either get one or the other. Now with an HD tap and this type of ground glass, maybe you could tell your focus without having to worry about looking through the camera. But how does this camera work with it? With with that? What do you do? Put a screen here and and just kind of like that? I don't know how you how you'd use it. I don't know. And then you got all those cables and anyway, talk to the guys at Dewall. Those guys are great. And and if you if you have a Bolex and you want to have accessories for it and you want to learn more about the cameras, they're the guys, right? Pick up the phone, give them a call. They're New Jersey, so um, they're the guys that everybody kind of uses to get accessories for these cameras. Um, so now let's go ahead and break down the camera a little bit and talk about some of the details it has. And, um, and then we'll go and punch into some close-ups. So, um, the camera from top to finish, from, from kind of the top of the camera to the bottom of the camera, this is your diopter up here for your eyepiece. Um, this is where the plug goes in for the magazines, the power of the magazines. This little switch here, you can barely see it. This little switch here shuts off the viewfinder, right? So if you take your head away, you can shut the viewfinder off. Uh, you've got the um, footage used. You've got your um, speed selection, including this knob that says sync, which allows you to run with the sync generator, which again, I haven't gotten working, but supposedly it works. You got your rewind here. It's got integrated filters. So you kind of slide this lever out and the filters come out. And so that's really cool to be able to have integrated filters. Um, so then you don't have to have like NDs on you. You can kind of leave an ND in here and then when you want to use it, you slide it in. Now, one really critical point is that you have to always have a filter in here or block this with a piece of tape because light will come in and leak into your frame if you don't have this in. So be a fair warning. All the bayonet cameras, all the Rex 5s, all the cameras that have this filter slot have to have a filter in it at all times. Not necessarily engaged, but physically in the slot. Unless you put a piece of gaff tape over the whole assembly, then you're okay. 
Um, the lens release is kind of here at the bottom. It's this little button right here. And then the whole bayonet twist, we sh showed that earlier in the video. Um, your start and stop is actually on the handle. And the handle kind of goes on with this kind of neat system. It's this keyed system. So there's a little ring on the bottom of the camera and there's a key in the ring. And so you basically put this on and line it up with that key. And then you kind of slide this lever over and it locks into place. And then there is a um, cable at the top here. You plug in and you tighten down. It's actually really well thought out. I, I have to admit that they really thought this camera out really well. And, and it's probably the reason why I like it so much because it is a really well thought out camera. And uh, now you're ready to go. If we ran the camera right now, it's it'll run. The battery solution is another issue with this camera. It takes a very proprietary battery, but do all camera has them in stock. It's this basically little tubular battery. It's 12 volts and it's pretty easy to get a hold of. It uses positive terminals. If it's put in backwards, it will blow the fuse of the camera, which is in the bottom of the camera, pretty easy to access. But that's how it goes together. Really, really simple design. So now to put film in it, I think I got a roll of film over here somewhere. To put film in it, you know, we're gonna start by just, you know, opening up our new box. So here's a new box, it's open. And remember, daylight spools, I suggest loading daylight spools in beyond subdued light, right? So bathroom, lights off, you know, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a light in the corner of the room or something so you can see something, right? But really subdued light, no direct light onto the roll of film ever. Um, if you wanna see what direct light looks like when you're loading a camera, take a look at this footage. This is footage I shot on a vacation trip a little while ago and I had to load this roll of film in the light. There was nowhere else to go. And so I was totally screwed with this and I tried my hardest. I had a jacket over and it still had a lot of issues in the first couple seconds of the roll. So that's what happens when you have direct light in the film. It is really bad. Don't do it. <laughs> the proper way to load the camera is to push the roll of film in first and then go ahead and chop off the end to make it have a perfect angle. And then we're going to go ahead and turn it to loading mode. And then we're going to make a, the, the uh, head of it have a little crease. And then we're going to push it with our finger against the sprocket drive. At the same time, we're going to run the motor. So you see I'm pushing against the sprocket drive. Then I'm going to run the motor and it's going to suck it up and suck it right through the other side. Really simple. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab our daylight spool and we're going to feed it into our daylight spool and then wrap it around and then push the daylight spool onto the camera and the take up side. And then we're going to release the mechanism for the auto load. I like to thread the camera outside of the camera. I just take the roll of film and I, I, um, I have it outside of the camera like this and I just push it in. And then I just go ahead and I lock this in and then I go ahead and run it and it'll just go right through. Whoops. Just like that. Put that in and then what I'll do is I'll put the film into the hole here. There it is into the hole. And then I will make sure, I will run it a little bit to make sure it's okay. Because I have found sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes the bottom loop is really, really tight. Now it has an automatic loop former, so if it loses the loop, it will automatically pull the loop down and form a new one. But you don't want to rely on that, all right? You don't want to do that. So, um, what I generally do is I'll pull down the bottom loop to make sure that the loop's okay. Because the bottom loop is where your problems are going to be. It's always going to be the bottom loop. So I make sure that the so that both loops are big enough. Just like that. And the camera's good to go. Then I'll put the top on it. And now we're good. So, so remember when I was talking about sound? So listen to how loud this camera is, okay? So the tickety-tickety part is really not what makes it loud. It's the motor drive. Listen to it again. But that's that's it. That's how easy it is to load the camera. Just that's it. And then if you when you're done with it, you know, you just it's a reverse process. The pressure plate's kind of cool. I actually made a whole video about about the pressure plate in this camera and how different it is than the earlier cameras. It's a 
It's a very, very different design. Um, it's going to be in the video about uh, Bolze. So we got a video coming up all about um, Bolze and the development of this camera. Um, and we show some really neat things. And in that video, we talk about our, our 37 camera and the Model B. I think we have a Model A. We have a Model A, actually. And so stick around for that video. As my whole set falls apart today, I think it's a good opportunity to end this video. Thanks for watching the video about the EBM. Um, we'll have lots of videos like this coming in the future. So stick around. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see you next time.